Hi, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, welcome to another edition of Hand in Focus, and the team for tonight is Thumb Arthritis. My name is Harvey Chim. I'm from the University of Florida, and I'll be co-moderating this session with Kyle Eblin from MGH Harvard Medical School. We have an exciting lineup of papers for tonight. Our first paper is uh, entitled Suture Suspension Arthroplasty for Thumb Carpal Metacarpal Arthritis Reconstruction 12 to 14 Year Follow-Up. And we have Dr. Del Signori and Dr. Uh, Balatori joining us tonight. And our second paper for tonight is entitled Denovation as a Treatment for Arthritis of the Hands, a Systematic Review of the Current Literature. And we have Dr. Zhu and Dr. Uh, McRae joining us tonight. Our expert for tonight is uh, Marco Rizzo. He's a professor of orthopedic surgery and chief of the hand surgery division at the uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's a personal dear friend and an expert in thumb arthritis, so I'm really excited to hear what he has to say tonight. So the format for tonight is similar to what we've done for previous journal clubs. We'll first have fellows from the Mayo Clinic who will present a synopsis of the articles. And tonight we have Dr. Kitty Wu and uh, Courtney Carlson Stroder joining us tonight. Uh, this will be followed by an author discussion and then an expert discussion. And finally, an open question and answer session and discussion. So just some general housekeeping points. Please mute your microphones. Cameras should be off while the speakers are presenting. Cameras can be turned on for the Q&A. Please ensure that your Zoom screen name is your first and your last name. And we welcome questions. So please enter questions in the chat or you know, if we have an opportunity, we'll love to have you ask your questions live. This session is really designed to be engaging and interactive. And it's really the discussion that we hope to be a learning point for everybody. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Wu to present our first paper. Can everyone hear me and see my slides? Yes, we can. Yes. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of tonight's Journal Club. I'll be presenting the first paper by Dr. Del Signore, Zambito, and Balatori, published recently in hand, and we're fortunate to have two of the authors joining us tonight for the discussion. Sorry, I'm just trying to advance my slides. The suture suspension arthroplasty technique was first described by Drs. Del Signore and Accardi in 2009. And this created an intra-articular suture suspension sling anchored between the FCR and the APL tendons. This stabilized the thumb metacarpal, corrected any subluxation, and also helped to maintain the arthroplasty space following trapeziectomy. This was usually performed under regional anesthesia with an operative time of 20 to 25 minutes. As a brief overview of this technique, this is performed through a volar of Wagner incision. The thinner muscles are reflected, the capsules in size, and a trapeziectomy performed. The suture sling is then created using an O-gauge braided non-absorbable polyester suture. This is placed as distally as possible. It's first passed forehand as seen in the top photo through the insertion of APL and the dorsal capsule, and then backhanded through the insertion point of the FCR tendon, also grasping some of the deep joint capsule and FCR subsheath, and then passed back through the APL tendon and dorsal capsule. This is performed a second time, similar to that illustration on the previous slide, to create a four strand suture hammock that cradles the base of the thumb metacarpal. And then with longitudinal and downward ulnarly directed pressure on the dorsal base of the thumb metacarpal, the suture is tied down over the APL insertion. The dorsal capsule and thinner muscles are repaired to their origin. Postoperatively, patients are put into a thumb spike, a splint for 10 to 14 days, and then switched to a short opponent splint with gentle active range of motion. Strengthening starts at six weeks and unrestricted activity at 12 weeks if patients are doing well. The current study reported on long-term 12 to 14 year outcomes of this technique from the patients who had undergone a suture arthroplasty procedure between 2006 and 2007, 85 were able to return for long-term follow-up at a mean of 12.6 years postoperatively. For each patient, the authors collected baseline demographic information, grip, key, and tip pinch strength, and quick dash scores. Radiographic subsidence was assessed by comparing preoperative and postoperative standardized PA films measuring the distance between the thumb metacarpal base and the distal pole of the scaphoid. In terms of the results, the average age at the time of surgery was almost 62 years and 82% were women. This included 85 patients, five of which had staged bilateral surgery. 
There was significant improvement in grip strength with a mean increase of three kilograms, increase in key pinch of 0.9 kilograms, and also a tip pinch of 0.7 kilograms. The average radiographic subsidence comparing pre and post operative was a 30% loss of height. And at final follow up, quick dash scores revealed good to excellent pain relief with a mean score of 6.6. There was one revision performed for a patient with symptomatic 80% subsidence in MP hyperextension. This patient was revised with a bone to bone suture anchor suspension technique and an MP joint fusion. There were three patients with FCR ruptures occurring at the four to six week post-operative mark presenting with localized tenderness and bruising that was mostly self-limiting and not really requiring any further treatment. There have been some minor modifications of this technique over the years and that have included prophylactic tenotomy of the FCR at the wrist flexion crease if there's greater than 50% narrowing of the tendon from attritional damage. And looking at table one, this provides a qualitative comparison of this technique with four other representative studies, including one from Dr. Weiss's group who performed a modified suture suspension arthroplasty through a dorsal incision. They presented their follow-up at 5.4 years with fairly comparable results as well. Overall, the suture suspension arthroplasty provides a single incision technique without the need for sacrificing any donor tendons. It avoids the need for drill holes or K-wire fixation and also provides a shorter operative time. The long-term results presented here show significant improvements in grip and pinch strength, maintenance of the arthroplasty space, and excellent patient-reported outcomes in the Quick Dash questionnaire. Thank you, and I look forward to the author's comments. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the excellent presentation, Kitty. I'd like to next invite the authors, Dr. Del Signore and Dr. Balatori, to give their take on this paper. Um, I'll go ahead. Thank you very much for that um, presentation. Um, yeah, that was uh, very thorough. I was asked to present a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, regarding the article, but I think you pretty much covered everything. So I'm going to um, see if I can share my screen and I'm going to uh, forward through um, pretty much all of this. So if I can just get on to uh, screen share, I'm going to zoom through most of my slides. Is my screen being shared properly now? Uh, no, we, we cannot see it yet. Can you see that? Um, not at the moment. Okay, sorry. Let me just do this and show. Sorry about that. I'm clicking on share screen again. There it is. Share. And how about now? Yep, we see it. Thank okay, you. Okay, good enough. Thank you. And I'm just going to get this out of the way. Hand surgery is easier than sharing the screen. So um, thank you very much. I'm going to just hit on a few points here. Um, as we know, I'll know that the thumb CMC arthritis is uh, very, very prevalent. And um, currently, the CMC arthritis does uh, represent the most commonly reconstructed joint in the upper extremity. And as we all know, there are multiple surgical options that exist with no technique showing clear advantage over another. Um, currently, trapeziectomy with or without stabilization and or interposition of autologous material is the most common form of treatment. Many surgeons, however, have been migrating towards a simpler, lower morbidity and reliable solution. Um, as was mentioned, the suture suspension arthroplasty was actually developed in, in 06, published in 09. Seven-year follow-up data was uh, published in 2015 and the 12 to 14 year follow-up 2021. Uh, but again, I, I prefer the Voller approach, the Wagner incision and creation of a zero gauge four strand intraarticular suspension sling uh, placed distally into the APL and FCR insertions with additional uh, locking sutures in the FCR and deep subsheath. Uh, average surgical times approximately 25, uh, 22 minutes. I'm gonna go right through this because this was just shown, but there's a Wagner incision with complete trapeziectomy longitudinal traction being as the suture is inserted through the APL and dorsal capsule and then backhanded through the FCR and deep subsheath with additional deep locking sutures. This is passed twice through the space to create a hammock suspension sling. Close up of the four strand sling in place. 
And as was mentioned, uh, dorsal pressure was applied to approximate base of thumb towards base of index. The capsule was repaired with a running interlocking 3-0 ethabon suture, and the thenars are brought back to their origin to completely cover the suture knot. The post-operative protocol for this technique is 14 days immobilization in a bulky bandage with a thumb spica plaster splint, which is removed at 14 days, at which time patients are placed into a short prefabricated CMC splint and start active range of motion. The splint is weaned and strengthening is started at six weeks and I discontinue the splint at eight weeks. Patients are released to resume full use at three months postoperatively, but are reassured that it can take six months to a year with any type of reconstructive surgery for the patients to reach a plateau. Um, I'm going to go right through here because this was all mentioned in the review of the paper, but uh, in a nutshell, this was a case series of one surgeon's experience uh, from the beginning of 2006 to the end of 2007, during which time 153 procedures were performed and data were analyzed in terms of age, sex, preoperative, grip and pin strength, subsidence, and postoperative patient reported outcome using the DASH questionnaire. Um, as you know, the re results were that we had a 59% recall, 82% female, five bilateral procedures, and there was one revision surgery, as mentioned, along with three FCR ruptures, all of which occurred at approximately four to six weeks post-op after a sudden inadvertent and accidental stress injury. All of these resolved without any need for further treatment. As you know, the results show 34% subsidence, which is comparable to other reports in the literature, and an average quick dash of 6.6%, along with statistically significant improvement in grip and pin strength. These are just some x-rays showing preoperatively parallelism of the thumb and index metacarpal with progressive subluxation, and postoperatively following the procedure with correction of subluxation deformity and reasonable maintenance of joint arthroplasty height. These are radiographs of patients at 13 and another patient at 14 years post-op, again showing maintenance of joint arthroplasty height and restoration of first web space angle. These are some clinical photos of patients at six weeks post-op, at which time strengthening is commenced, and at 13 years post-op, showing alignment and range of motion. I believe that there are uh, benefits to this procedure that uh, assist both the patient as well as the surgeon in the facility, and that this is a lower morbidity procedure and that it involves only a single incision with no tendon sacrifice, no drill hole formation, no K-wire issues. And for most, but certainly not all patients, less stiffness due to more immediate stabilization, earlier range of motion, and unrestricted use by three months postoperatively. The surgeon in the facility benefits from a lesser invasive surgery in that this procedure does involve a shorter operative time on average 22 minutes. And it is cost effective in that there are no K-wires, anchors, or implants required. This has been shown to be a simple reproducible technique adopted by uh, many of my colleagues and also compared to other methods with comparable outcome. In terms of the downside of this procedure, I believe that there are several as there are with all procedures. This does require a precise suture technique that I do recommend that the suture be placed as distally as possible into the APL insertion as well as the FCR insertion in deep subsheath with additional locking sutures for additional anchorage. The caveat is that too far proximal placement of this sling may cause loss of arthroplasty space, bow stringing or destabilization of the FCR, or even potential FCR rupture. This procedure has to rely on soft tissue integrity, which may not always be present, and I don't believe that this procedure is the best choice for revisions or patients with severe laxity, marked collapse deformity, or heavy functional demands. For those patients, I still would recommend a suture suspension arthroplasty, but consider it with a suture anchor with some type of bone-to-bone -bone suspension. These are some x-rays of a patient in, in whom I did the uh, titanium suture anchor reinforcement, still utilizing the suture suspension technique, the placement of a, a titanium anchor to the base of index metacarpal, again from the bowler approach, onto the facet of the index metacarpal, uh, just adjacent to the FCR insertion, preoperatively showing subluxation deformity with pantropezal involvement, postoperatively showing the correction of the subluxation deformity, and also postoperatively showing restoration of first web space angle with ample space in the uh, joint arthroplasty height. The limitations of this study have been mentioned, but this was a retrospective level four case series with no controls. 59% recall is not bad for a 12 to 14 year follow-up, but it could have been better. And also a significant limitation was that there were no pre-op dash uh, questionnaires performed preoperatively. 
In summary, I believe that this procedure is yet another procedure that can be considered, uh, considered in the armamentarium of the hand surgeon to treat thumb CMC arthritis, for which there are a multitude of different choices, all of which have uh, very good outcomes. One of the advantages of this procedure is that this is a simple, low morbidity, reliable, and cost-effective method with patient and surgeon benefits, creating a suture suspension sling, which I like to describe as a hammock, between the distalmost insertion points of the APL and FCR, effectively tethering the base of thumb metacarpal towards the base of the index, correcting subluxation deformity, and maintaining reasonable arthroplasty height. Long-term results with this procedure reveals similar outcomes to other methods of trapeziectomy with or without ligament reconstruction. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss this paper further. Hey, thank you so much, that was uh, excellent. And uh, next I'd like to invite our expert, Dr. Rizzo to give us his take uh, on this paper tonight. Marco, I think you're on mute. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Um, uh, thank Marco, you, Dr. Segaria. Yeah, we, we, don't, we don't see your slides as well. Yeah, I, I haven't shared yet, um, okay. but I'm happy to share. But I was going to say, Harvey, one thing that we might could do is um, maybe I had a series of questions, and I, I, I see we're down to about 13 minutes before we have to switch to the other topic. Um, I'm happy to... Um, I'm happy to go through my talk real quick or just initiate questions uh, do you have a preference or I, I don't have a preference whatever you think would be um, best for the discussion well I'll briefly say that, that I'm one of the dinosaurs and having learned so much from our friends at at University of Rochester <laughs> I would love to ask Dr. Del Signore uh, why um, uh, what made her what prompted you to move away from an LRTI type procedure when when you did this well, I'm, I moved away from the LRTI procedure shortly um, uh, in the middle of my hand surgery fellowship where um, uh, the, the surgeons who trained me in Indiana had moved towards more of an APL suspension rather than removing the FCR tendon. So I was doing uh, APL suspension plasty. What, what prompted me to uh, develop this operation was the old necessity is the mother of invention uh, method and that there was a patient for whom I was going to be doing an APL suspension plasty, wrapping it around the, uh, the, the, the distal portion of the FCR tendon. And that patient, the day before I was operating on her, was pulling weeds in her garden quite vigorously and ruptured her FCR tendon. So she presented to the operating room the following day for surgery with a red swollen forearm with pain and an FCR attritional traumatic rupture. At that point, I looked at the surgical field and said, well, I can't use the FCR because it's ruptured. I can't loop it around the FCR, the APL around the FCR, because the FCR is gone, but the stump of the FCR was there. And at that point, I just decided to see if I could stabilize the base of thumb to the base of index with a, with a suture. So I went ahead and did that on this uh, older patient, uh, being quite frightened that I had just uh, had not helped her very much because I'd never done a suture suspension before. And I was really quite impressed with how she ran circles around any patient I had ever operated on before. I started to extend my indications using this procedure on some other patients, but I kept it to the older, lower, sed lower uh, activity sedentary individuals who all flew right past all my patients that I was doing APL suspension plasties. And after about six months, I continued to expand the indications for the suture suspension. And after approximately six months, I never took a tendon from a forearm ever again and, uh, and found that the patients did much better because of the lower morbidity and the uh, uh, much uh, quicker uh, recovery in terms of range of motion uh, without having to make additional incisions, longer incisions, or sacrificing either an FCR or even a slip of the APL. So this was definitely uh, created on the spot, as we oftentimes in surgery have to create on the fly or uh, as we say, you pull it out of whatever orifice you want to talk about. But this was something that had to be uh, invented on the spot when the challenge presented itself. And that's where this procedure came from. Nothing too exciting. That's fantastic. Um, 
you know, I, I do uh, an LRTI procedure for, for mine, and I'm going to go through this briefly, just reviewing the anatomy, obviously understanding the, the ligaments of the thumb are very important stabilizers, and as they, as they become attritionally incompetent, it invites shearing and the, the arthritis, and also the fact that there's a magnification of loading at the base of the thumb, it's a perfect storm for development of the arthritis. Um, again, as I, as I mentioned before, I prefer an LRTI. I do the suture suspension a little bit like uh, Dr. Del Signore discussed uh, uh, for revision cases, and I tend to um, prefer the bone-to-bone -bone suspension, such as the tightrope. Um, this is an example of an LRTI procedure I would do now. Um, uh, the Just to go real quickly, the trapeziectomy, and I tend to harvest the entire FCR. I pull it through and uh, I do create a drill hole in the bone and uh, pull it through the bone, uh, suture it to the capsule, and then fold it into an anchovy and pack it into the space. And my results have been good, I would say. I, I do want, I would do, uh, this does lend me to another discussion. Um, as I, I tell folks, it's a pretty good pain relieving procedure, but it's not as predictable in improving strength. And I, I, I wonder, uh, a lot of studies suggest once you take out the trapezium that you don't get as, get as predictably uh, strength improvement. How do you advise your patients, Dr. Zelsignore? Do, do, you, do you confidently say I, you're gonna get stronger or is it based on what their pre-op strength is more? Um, I, I believe that um, patients are so happy that their strength is improved from what it was preoperatively, that I have not had too many patients say that there are things they there are things they can't do because they weren't strong enough. Uh, I, I think that's the relative improvement in strength is what we see when you look at the preoperative um, grip and pin strength and see the significant improvement. Um, and I do believe that with all forms of CMC reconstruction, the most important parameter that really defines your success is how happy your patient is. As, as we get older, particularly we look at our patients in our 60s, 70s, and 80s, they start to lose strength just because of age and uh, muscle atrophy and arthritis and other parts of their hands. So it's not at all uncommon that a patient with or without CMC surgery starts to lose strength as they get a bit older. But the improvement of their strength because they don't have that antallergic weakness in their hand because you've taken away their pain is usually something that patients are, are really quite happy regardless of what technique is, is utilized. Okay. The, um, the one thing um, also that I, I appreciated from your presentation was the ability to bring the thumb back into more radial abduction. Um, do you find that your indications for treating MCP preoperative hyperextension become less and less as a result of this technique? I have, uh, Marco, um, that's a good point because the, the, the cookie cutter approach for X degrees of hyperextension requires a capsulodesis and X plus 20, 60 degrees of hyperextension requires a fusion. I always would treat the uh, uh, metacarpophalangeal joint if the, uh, if the patient is symptomatic. And an asymptomatic hyperextensible thumb, when you bring the base of thumb towards the base of index, unless someone has a lot of uh, collapse weakness of the thumb. I, I tend to shy away to being very conservative in terms of doing anything to the MP joint, because honestly, when you bring the base of thumb back towards base of index, um, you, I don't think you have to just routinely do a capsulodesis. And in terms of an MP joint fusion, uh, typically I would prefer to, to uh, uh, not do that unless the patient actually has symptomatic MP joint arthritis. Perfect. And that's something I know you mentioned the, uh, the, the suture button procedure. You mentioned the word tightrope. One of my concerns about that type of methodology is it's more of a syndesmosis type of uh, device. Then instead of bringing base of thumb and index together, you can actually recreate some of the parallelism. So it's difficult to get the, the bases of both of the thumb and index to approximate with a suture that's placed a bit further distally from the uh, axis of the joint. So this is a case of a failed uh, in the tightrope. So on this image here, more of a syndesmotic kind of, mm -hmm. kind of, not as much of that abduction that you would get with uh, the suture suspension, right? I, I agree. And that's, I, I believe that the, uh, 
the, the dual suture button uh, technique is really a, a great direction forward, uh, just teaching us that it is not uh, always necessary to utilize a tendon for a suture sling to hold the, the, the thumb together, because if you can hold it together with a, with a suture placed in the uh, correct alignment to reconstruct the first web space, and to bring base of thumb towards base of index with an intraarticular construct, I think that that's getting us more in the right direction of some type of non-tendon uh, uh, suture suspension that gives immediate stabilization. One last question. Um, in Wildby's initial, this is sort of a Wildby with a suture to me as I think about this. Um, in Wildby's initial paper, oh, 100 patients, uh, he had a fairly substantial incidence of decur veins um, postoperatively. Mm -hmm. um, well, have you seen that in your experience? With this procedure, the uh, the suture that goes through the APL is literally at the insertion. It's a bone scraping as close as you possibly can suture being passed at the APL insertion right where it inserts on the base of the thumb. I believe if you have your suspension or whether you're taking a, a slip of the APL um, a little bit too far approximately, then yes, you can hyperabduct the thumb and cause some tension in the first dorsal compartment. But with this particular technique, the suture really needs to be as absolutely distally as possible so you don't get that hyperextension deformity or traction on the APL tendon. So honestly, I've, I've not had that be a problem in my patients, but I'm pretty fastidious in terms of recommending where the sutures go. I lied, one last, one last question. Um, <laughs> so I see subsidence, everyone sees subsidence. Your, your incidence of subsidence was impressively low. I, does that affect outcome subsidence in your, with this technique? I mean, are they clinically just as good or, or do, you, my, do you, if you see subsidence? My subsidence ranged from zero to 90%. The average was 34%. And so with, with many sort of procedures, whether it's with the, um, uh, the suture button or with the suture suspension arthroplasty that my colleague Peter Weiss described this with a, with a dorsal approach, uh, right about 30 to 35% seems to be the most common degree of subsidence. So I do think that, that they all do tend to subside um, between anywhere from zero to 90%. Your question as to whether or not subsidence affects outcome, there have been uh, several papers written. I think uh, Andy Weiland is one of them that comes to mind that uh, uh, he described whether or not subsidence had any role in the patient outcome, meaning the patient comfort and their um, and their happiness with the procedure. And th there have been a lot of papers that have suggested that subsidence doesn't matter. Um, I do think that subsidence is a problem if the thumb metacarpal is sitting on the scaphoid. That could be a problem because you'll get painful impingement. And I think that it's also incredibly important that we look at subsidence somewhat, but we have to look at correction of subluxation deformity as really being paramount in terms of reconstructing that first web space, which realigns the base of thumb and index to its more normal anatomic uh, orientation. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really excellent discussion. Um, I know we're running short on time, but I just have one question I'd like to ask you then, uh, Errol, and, and we're going to run through, a, there are a bunch of questions in the chat. So I'd like to ask um, your opinions on the duration of your immobilization. So Dr. Del Signore, I know you immobilize people, your patients for two weeks, but you had three instances of FCR rupture. So do you think that immobilizing them longer might have helped create some more scarring? And Marco, I know if you still do things the same way that you mobilize people for quite a long period of time, for six weeks, if I remember correctly. So I'd just love to hear your takes, you know, on why you immobilize for a short and long period of time. Um, I allow patients to start moving at 14 days post-op, so just two weeks, and they're in a prefabricated splint. And I think that um, th there's actually enough discomfort that the patients don't do crazy things at 14 weeks, so just active range of motion is started, but they're in their brace pretty much all the time, except for some gentle active range of motion and taking it off for bathing. Then we have a progressive uh, motion under supervised hand therapy in terms of more motion. I don't even allow strengthening until a patient is six weeks post-op. In terms of the cases of FCR ruptures, those all occurred with an accidental incident at approximately four to six weeks post-op when the patient, some patients slipped and fell, someone went to catch somebody, someone was telling themselves off and had a sudden 
uh, hard uh, resisted force of wrist flexion and radial deviation. So each of those incidents that occurred, occurred with a, a patient reported um, uh, mistake that just occurred accidentally, inadvertent, sudden stress didn't happen just with them following protocol. So I, I don't, I would prefer to start the range of motion just to uh, uh, minimize uh, stiffness. And with only a 3% um, FCR rupture, that's a pretty small number. We just really try to encourage patients to be, to be careful during that period of time. And also in the, uh, in the paper I published, there are things that I've learned over the years. If I see an FCR tendon that is about to rupture, say about 50% attritional narrowing of the FCR tendon, after I do my suture suspension sling, I then do an FCR tenotomy right at the wrist flexion crease. Because if that FCR looks like it's about to blow, I don't, I don't let that happen anymore. I'll go ahead and do a, a tenotomy right then and there. And it tends to scar into the sheath. And still they can experience a rupture as it, as it slides forward. But um, if, you, if you see that that tendon's hanging by a thread, you do the patient a favor by uh, doing the tenotomy after you've uh, secured the suture suspension sling at the insertion of the FCR. You don't really need the FCR there anymore. And uh, Marco, what's your take on this? Yeah, I, I don't think, um, I try to encourage patients to give this time uh, for the recovery. And it's hard nowadays because everything's so much sexier and everyone's trying to get people moving right away and show how quickly they can get someone doing whatever. But I, I have seen cases uh, that have been referred to me. And I, it's interesting. I often tell our residents and fellows, there's three things that are gonna shape your practice. And what you do, one is what how you're trained, two is what the literature tells you, and three is what your own personal experience is. And you can't you can't ignore the, your own what comes in the door I and mean, the patients, much like uh, Dr. Del Signore talked about her case that sort of inspired her to consider this. Um, and I have a procedure that works. It's slow. It's it's uh, it's not uh, a quickie recovery. Um, but it works in my hands, and um, it's hard to, it's hard for me sometimes to think about changing too much, although I have loosened a little bit on some of the, the immobilization period, you know, I'm more flexible with immobilizing or graduating to a removable splint at four weeks rather than six weeks. Um, I, I think if you're too hasty, sometimes you invite all kinds of other problems. I, I personally don't think that an FCR rupture is a big deal. Uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, if that's the worst that happens to the patient, I think that they, though their pain will go away. Most, you know, most people after they rupture their FCR is, uh, is um, their pain goes away after the rupture. So, um, but I think it's, uh, I think they need time to sort of get over the surgery, get the healing process started. I mean, I don't even think the tendon would have enough time to scar in if you're counting on the, the, the tendon to heal to itself. If you start moving too soon, I, I would think it would disrupt the healing uh, that you're trying to achieve between the tendons, if you're trying to achieve that at all. That's my thoughts. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have uh, two related questions in the chat. Dr. Camille LeMay was asking if you have had issues with impingement of the base of the first metacarpal and the base of the second metacarpal of your technique and if you have any tips to avoid this issue. And Dr. David Well was asking how to set the tension and if you use any locking sutures. So I guess these questions are kind of related because obviously with any technique, if you, you tighten it too much, you may have problems such as you cannot put the thumb flat on the table, which can occur with like any other suspension plasty. So I was wondering what are your tips to set the tension just right with your suture? Um, whether you are using a tendon graft, tendon transfer or a suture, uh, the sins of the surgeon are always present. So you have to make sure that when you are uh, tightening up whatever the form of sling is that you don't over tighten. Uh, many people have talked about when you are actually bringing the sling together, whether you're using uh, uh, a uh, suture suspension with the dual buttons, whether you're using a double suture anchor or whether you're using a suture suspension, I think it's helpful to longitudinally distract the thumb. Uh, as you're pressing the thumb down towards base of index so that you're actually somewhat slackening your, your sling. You don't want to be, if you have a little bit of traction on your thumb, when you suture it down, as you let the thumb come back down, there's more, there's more play 
in the suture suspension sling. You want to just approximate but not strangulate, which is an old adage from my years of general surgery, that you just want to approximate base of thumb to base of index and not push it down to the point that the thumb is coming off at a 90 degree angle. So if you if you are reapproximate with your approximating base of thumb to index without undue tension, it doesn't matter whether you're doing it with a suture suspension sling or an FCR with an LRTI or an APL. You just have to have that sense of being able to approximate uh, tissues together without squishing them together. So those are just some of the tricks is longitudinal traction on the thumb as you're putting in the suture sling. So as you relax on it, you have more play or, or bounce in your suture suspension sling. And um, uh, I, I think that can help quite a bit. Uh, there are really no tricks other than uh, other than to make it right, and that's not that's not specific for the suture suspension sling. That's for any form of reconstructive surgery, whether it's a tendon transfer or CMC reconstruction. Uh, I'll echo those sentiments, uh, and then Harvey, you, you probably don't remember it was a hundred years ago that you were with me. <laughs> But Kitty and I do and, remember, yes. know that you know distraction is really important in that LR the ligament reconstruction portion of that of that procedure, and I, I call that the most important part of the case mm -hmm. you know, in that thumb base and, and securing the, uh, the the ligament reconstruction. Yep, that's totally I think. Um, yep. I think that we should uh, move on in a moment to the next paper. There's been a great discussion. The final questions in the chat are about the therapy protocols. And, and uh, there, there are some therapists on the call, which is excellent. We are, are so happy you're here. We, I wonder if Dr. Del Senor and Dr. Rizzo could just mention briefly how they utilize um, their hand therapists in the recovery for these patients. And then in a moment or two, we'll move on to the, front, the next paper. I can go very quickly. The therapy starts at uh, two weeks post-op. When the bandages come off, the therapist sees them that day and puts them in a uh, prefabricated splint and just starts gentle active range of motion to make sure that they're moving their wrist and doing some circumduction exercises of their thumb. No, uh, no pinching, no stress, no grasping with the thumb whatsoever. Strengthening is commenced at six weeks post-op. And at that point, that's when we start to wean the splint. And at eight weeks post-op, we allow them to discontinue the splint. At three months post-op, we allow the patients to resume full use without restrictions fully supporting them that um, it does take six months to a year. I don't care if it's a suture suspension or an LRTI. That's just how long it takes the trauma of reconstructive surgery to become quiescent. Great. Thank you Thank so much. You. Everything Dr. Del Signore said, except four weeks later. Mm -hmm. Great. Right, so we're going to move on uh, in the spirit of uh, less invasive surgery. Uh, we're going to move on to discussing Denervation as a treatment for arthritis in the hands, a uh, systemic review of the current literature. Dr. Struther will be uh, presenting the paper for the next few moments, uh, and then we'll have the authors uh, as well. So why don't we get started? Uh, it's been a great discussion, and everyone, please feel free to uh, add some questions to the chat. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'll move forward here, um, and thank you for letting me present uh, this article for discussion. As a, as a systematic review of the current literature uh, looking at denervation for treatment of arthritis in the hands, uh, Dr. Zhu and McRae um, and colleagues, and appreciate them here uh, being with first discussions. Um, uh, Courtney, so, just to, to jump in, you're, we're, we're looking at your uh, presenter mode here. Uh, oh, if you wanna... let's see here. Courtney, if you have two screens, you might want to swap the screens if you're on two okay. screens. That's, is this improved? Yeah, I, I've had this class before. Thank you. <laughs> there is we it, go. Oh, well, it's, it's doing the presenter uh, screen. On that, um, if you see on that, um, oh, go oh, ahead. Is go this ahead. better? Yes. Yes, okay. that's better. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so very briefly, there's been an increase in um, some of the interest in denervation procedures in the small joints of the hands. Um, since we know that there's been some success with uh, denervation of the wrist. Um, so there's multiple denervation techniques that do exist, uh, denervation of small joints of the hand, but there's no uh, synthesized data on some of these outcomes. And so the purpose of this article was to review and to evaluate <clears throat> the outcomes and complications of joint denervation for arthritis in the joints of the hand. Uh, so again, this is a systematic review of all adult patients with either rheumatoid or osteoarthritis of the hand who underwent joint denervation surgery. 
patients who went joint innervation for non-arthritic conditions or who had concomitant hand injuries or had other surgeries to their hand were excluded. And the primary outcomes that they looked at were pain, function, and any complications following surgery. Um, and this table shows kind of how the process of their systematic review and in total, there are 10 studies which were included in the analysis, including eight Kate series, one retrospective cohort study, and one prospective cohort study. So together, there are 211 joint denervation procedures and 192 patients who were diagnosed with osteoarthritis of their hand. The mean age at this time was uh, 61, approximately 61 years, and uh, mean follow-up was approximately 37, um, 37 months. And um, of the way that um, the, of the 10 articles, seven of them looked at denervation of the first CMC joint, and the main, remaining three looked at denervation of the MCP, PIP, and DIP joints. Table two demonstrates the surgical approaches of these studies, including the different nerves that were targeted for a resection. Um, and then also of note, only one of the studies entered the joint um, as part of the surgical treatment of CMC arthritis. Uh, tables three and figure two looked at the uh, pain outcomes that were reported from the different studies. And um, of course, as, you know, as expected, the multiple different uh, pain outcomes were reported. However, the uh, authors were able to look at pre and post-operative pain scores from the three studies that are highlighted here in yellow. And these were pooled and analyzed using a paired t-test, which revealed a statistically significant reduction in post-operative pain from 6.61 preoperatively to 1.69 postoperatively, as shown in figure two. Uh, table four looked at the different functional outcomes following these sur surgeries, and they included, looked at grip and pinch strength, Kapanji oppositional scale, and the DASH scores. And all of these studies did demonstrate some sort of improvement in average fun function postoperatively. Tables five and six looked at the complications rates following these denervation procedures, and these ranged from zero to 73% with a pooled complication rate of approximately 19%. CMC joint denervation had a lower complication rate compared with MCP and IP denervation procedures. The most common complications were neuropathic pain or unintended sensory loss, though all patients reported either eventual complete return of this sensation or reported this lack of sensation as functionally insignificant. Persistent pain was reported in approximately 6% of patients and was the second highest complication, though this was also reported separately from recurrence of pain symptoms, which was reported in approximately 3%. So the results of this review demonstrate a significant improvement in pain and function following selective denervation for hand osteoarthritis, though they do note that any improved function is likely secondary to pain relief. The authors compared postoperative pain scores and functional outcomes in CMC denervation compared to trapeziectomy, and they do suggest that they may produce similar pain relief and improved function, though they note that their sample size of denervation is significantly smaller and limited to case series compared with the more traditional options for first CMC arthritis. And they do note that this is a major limitation in the review. And lastly, hand denervation uh, has an overall mild complication profile, while failure to provide relief was one of the more comp common complications. One study in this review reported significant improvement in pain for patients who then underwent secondary trapeziectomy, suggesting that denervation does not alter outcomes following more traditional treatments of first CMC arthritis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Strother. I would next uh, like to invite Dr. Zhu and Dr. McRae, uh, the authors of the study, uh, to tell us a bit more about it. Hey, yes. So um, here, let me try and share my screen. Um, I think Dr. Strother summarized it very well. So some of the slides are actually quite similar. Um, so I'll just go through it pretty quickly. I'm Sarah, I'm one of the uh, plastic surgery residents from McMaster. Thank you for inviting us to your journal club. It's been very lovely to be here this evening. 
So yeah, so the really quick background, really how this came to be was because denervation was coming up as this kind of relatively new alternative as a surgical intervention for the small joint arthritis. And the real proposed benefits that were being stated was that it was relatively non-invasive, a pretty straightforward procedure to complete that preserved the native anatomy um, with a much shorter rehabilitation time compared to the more traditional procedures like trapeziectomies or arthrodesis and arthroplasties. And kind of reinvigorated by the fact that it's shown promising results in the wrist population. So we wanted to see if this was something that would be effective in hand joints for arthritis, and if so, how people were doing it, if it was safe to be done. And so, um, as mentioned already, we did a systematic review, mostly because in the preliminary search, we found that there was a lot of independent studies with authors describing their experience, but it was generally pretty um, poorly described in the literature. So we felt that this was the most appropriate way to synthesize the information. So we did come up with 10 studies following the PRISMA guidelines. And as you'll note there in the table, in the minor score category, the papers that we included didn't score particularly high. Um, but unfortunately, these 10 studies represented the majority of studies that were available discussing this topic in a clinical setting. And another thing to note is that the surgical indication for denervation within these studies broadly were very similar. So they were all offered to people with osteoarthritis who were referred to a surgical center because they failed um, conservative measures of pain and they hadn't had any surgery in that joint, that affected joint previously. Between the studies, there were some variations. So some studies would include all Eaton classifications, but there was one study that would only do it on Eaton class two and three. And there was another study that uh, didn't offer it as an option for people who had a Z deformity or decreased range of motion in that joint. Um, all of the studies that were included did go into their methods of how, how they did the denervation to some degree. Something to note, like within the first CMC, specifically for their denervation, the three nerves that were commonly targeted amongst all of the studies for the LABC, the posterior cutaneous branch of the median nerve, and the superficial radial nerve contributions into the capsule. But there were three studies, and I believe that the lower area was the first study of them that described also, unfortunately, within the within our study, at least, we weren't really able to comment on whether going after that articular branch of their current motor nerve changed anything about the efficacy of the procedure or the complication profile. Uh, so as previously mentioned, the data for both pain and function, which is our main ways of uh, looking at the efficacy of denervation, were pretty heterogeneous, so we we're pretty limited in the way that we were able to analyze the data. For what it's worth, each of the independent studies for function as well did find improvement. So I'll just blow through that pretty quickly because I think there was a pretty good summary on that already. But for the complications, so in the studies that we included, the follow-up ranged from five months up to five years. Within the 10 studies that we had and within the five years that they followed maximum patients, there were no reports of any significantly adverse events. So there was no CRPS, there was no reports of Charcot's joint, and there's no reports of anything like loss of proprioception. And the most common one of neuropathic pain or sensory loss, the papers that reported this actually that went on to say that it ended up becoming almost insignificant because the patient said that it either spontaneously recovered or they found it to be functionally insignificant. And um, with regard to treatment failure, as was mentioned, some of these patients did get offered then secondarily a more traditional procedure and they did well with that. Um, something else that was interesting to note is that of the 11 that had treatment failure, nine of them came from one study uh, by Salibi. And it uh, could be for a number of reasons. Um, one thing that was interesting that I noted in reviewing the articles, it was that uh, the methods that they, they described for denervating the first CMC was a little bit different than the other ones. Um, rather than identifying each of the individual branches into the joint capsule, they kind of just cauterized the soft tissue around it as a method of denervation. So hard to say if that uh, contributed at all um, to their findings. But generally, the conclusion, it seems that denervation is a pretty safe procedure with a low complication profile. Unfortunately, a significant limitation of the study would be the sample size and also the level of evidence of the studies that were included in this review. So we aren't able to make any real strong statements about how effective it is in terms of relieving pain or improving function, but it certainly seems promising as an alternative. And... Uh, could potentially be quite useful for a population of patients who maybe are looking for 
pain relief in a uh, slightly less invasive way, but um, I'm interested to kind of open the discussion up and see what everyone thinks about it. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I don't know if Dr. McRae wants to make any comments or just join in the discussion. Um, if yeah, not, I will. Please yeah, go ahead. I, certainly just join the discussion. I think, I think uh, with any systematic review, you really, you know, any kind of results that come from it are really a result of what was present in the primary studies, right? So we're obviously very uh, limited in what kind of conclusions you can make from, from this systematic review, for sure. Um, but, you know, I guess it's kind of uh, synthesizing what, what is available now. After this paper came out, about eight months later, a very similar paper came out in the Journal of Hand Surgery with really very similar conclusions. So um, that's just interesting. I think it's kind of a timely topic. Uh, it seems that, I guess, the hand surgery community is quite interested in it. It's just nice to know uh, where we're at right now. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's, a, I think, a great amount of interest in it. I would love to invite Dr. Rizzo as our expert to uh, make some comments about this. I think one fundamental question that I have about wrist denervation is how do we even define what is, uh, sorry, about a CMC denervation is how do we even define it? You know, what nerves have to be denervated to really define, to define the procedure? And I'm not even certain we have an answer to that question. So, Dr. Rizzo, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Dr. Eberlin. Um, you know, um, I have uh, also a talk, but I, I, I don't do this procedure. So I, and my talk was focused on early arthritis, people with STT joint sparing and what I do for those. And I'm happy to share that talk, but I'm also happy to discuss my experience with wrist denervation, which is quite extensive and how it applies to thumb denervation in the sense of my results with wrist denervation have never been quite as good as the literature. I think whenever someone publishes on, on their experience, there's this, and I, I'm not saying this in a derogatory way, I think there's just an enthusiasm or being in the study, some component of how the study is created and how patients are, re, are responded to creates like a an inflation of the actual experience to me. And I, I, I know it sounds derogatory, but it, I, I think it's true. Uh, or I'm just a bad salesman, like, because I think our enthusiasm as, as surgeons to a particular procedure, particularly if it's a new procedure, is contagious to the patient. And if you don't, and it's not, it's not sinister enthusiasm, it's, it's honest enthusiasm for something that's new and something that is, uh, you're hoping Will, will work. And I think that's contagious to the patient. But if you're not a good salesman like me, you tend to sort of sometimes sort of propagate all the bad that can come from the procedure. And you're promoting that and that plants a seed of doubt in the patient. And what I'm getting to is that there's a placebo effect to these procedures, in my opinion. And, um, you know, there's been some good studies, <laughs> New England Journal of Medicine studies, looking at sham procedures in the knee. Uh, partial meniscectomies versus make an incision and stop. And what they find is uh, in degenerative arthritis too, scoping for degenerative arthritis or sham procedures. Uh, and I think there's a component of a, of a quote unquote sham that occurs with these denervation procedures, if I could be frank. Now, I don't care. I, if it works, it works. If the patient's better, great. But I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, study something that's really complicated, you know, and, and we're trying to come up with a solution that uh, is going to be predictable. And largely, I think we as surgeons come to the table with a lot of sway in these cases and um, more than I, 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 I want to um, have, in my own opinion. I'd rather have more science than sway. Um, and um, Sammy Tufaha was one of our former fellows. He's one of the authors of one of the studies that you described, Sarah, or you included in the study. Uh, and, um, and his results were like pretty darn good, like 80, 90 percent, you know, pain relief. And um, I I think that's achievable, but I think we have to bring a lot of enthusiasm to the table with these with these cases. Um, I'm at a loss to explain the, the loss of sensation. It's obviously a very disappointing outcome. 
in those cases. And um, but my bigger concern would be the inability to uh, to um, achieve uh, desired results. Despite my lack, you know, I'm going to go back to the risk. But despite my lack of success to risk, because I tell patients it's a 50-50 what the risk. I still do it a lot. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. It just it just means that we need to, I think, I don't know. I don't know that we need to give the denervation as much credit as the other uh, nuanced variables. I gave this uh, presentation at uh, the Jupiter Forum in, at, at Boston on the wrist. And, and I had a lovely discussion with uh, um, David Ring, who is the king of discussion of psychological pain issues. And we had a real interesting talk about the reality of um, placebo and the power of placebo. And I wonder if in part, if we're not doing a, a sham surgery that happens to work. That's well, I, I, I will say, I, I actually recall your, your, your talk at that meeting and your conversation with, with, with David. It's, it's very intriguing. And, and your, your comments, I think, are spot on and quite provocative, Marco. Where, where, where do you think this fits into our armamentarium? And perhaps Dr. McGray wants to answer that too. I mean, should we be considering this for the sort of early stage arth arthritis where patients have a lot of pain? When should we really be thinking about this? I'm happy to let you, Dr. McCray, chime in first. Sure. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm happy to hear from you as well, Dr. Is, about this. But I mean, this basal thumb arthritis, I and mean, we have great operations for basal thumb arthritis, right? So we, we don't necessarily need something brand new. And, you know, even if it is, you know, two weeks of recovery and or, or no recovery, right? You're going out with a little bandage on your hand. Um, but there are patients, I will say, that I'm slow to offer, you know, trapeziectomy ligament reconstruction with, right? And these, and I think those are the patients that you might consider a procedure like this for. I mean, to me, if you look at it, if you look at someone's joint and you don't see arthritis, I mean, you could say it's stage one or it could be something else, right? So um, something else going on and, you know, you do your, you do your clinical examination, you do all your tests, you do, you know, you put steroid in the joint, it seems that there's something going on and here's, here's a, here's a surgery you can offer, uh, that could give sustained relief. And certainly I have had patients who have had some sustained relief from it. I will say, I don't, I guess the way I do the procedure, which I don't do often, but there are certain select indications. Um, the denervation part is essentially removing the nerve from, from its access to the capsule. And then I usually put something between, you know, the capsule and where, and where that nerve is coming from. Cause it, in my mind, the nerve is just going to re-innervate uh, immediately. So a dermal graft or, or, or something else to, to place between uh, that capsule and the nerve that you've denervated, um, uh, I think is a potentially key step though. Again, there's no data behind that comment. Um, Dr. Rizzo, are there any specific, I mean. Well, you know, I, I think your point's well taken, uh, you know, um, and I would say a couple of things. Um, you've added this now to your buffet table, okay? <laughs> so it's an option for the patients. And then you, you get to know your patients and you get a sense of whether this is something that is, seems attractive to them. And you can sort of point out the pros and cons of it. And to me, that's what's happened in the wrist, you know. Uh, but the wrist is a little bit more um, straightforward a discussion if you will, because oftentimes we're talking about a major carpentry-based procedure that's gonna likely limit motion, or the only other option is to fuse the wrist completely, which is a big step, um, or a wrist replacement, which is likely gonna fail in four or five years and then needs fusion. So it's a much more attractive, low-hanging fruit in the wrist, um, in the wrist uh, uh, discussion. In the, in the thumb, depending on the stage of arthritis, there may be less invasive options that you could consider. Um, but introducing that into the discussion will give you a sense of whether a patient would or would not be interested in it. And I think what's gonna evolve over time is a discussion about this being one option that's not quite in the, on the table for most of us yet. But as it becomes on the table for most of us, we'll find patients that uh, seem to want to embrace this. And um, I will say, you know, you have certain indications, you know, uh, you have an, a one-armed person, you know, or someone who 
you know, is a, a, you know, manual labor who doesn't want a fusion or doesn't want, you know, a, uh, uh, to commit to the LRTI. Um, you're going to find patients or, you know, someone who, who, uh, you know, the way the procedures have become so less invasive, it's going to be a little bit harder of a sell in some ways than, than it is at the wrist, in my opinion. Um, but once you introduce it, you get a sense of what the patients uh, sort of want to uh, go for, if you will. But we are, you know, you know, if I introduce this tomorrow to my next patient, they're going to say no, largely because of the way I present it. I'm going to be like, I don't know if it's going to work. It's, uh, you know, <laughs> and, you know, and, and um, that I've learned over the 20 years now that how I present it is going to um, have some influence on them. Um, I think so, without question, that is true. And I, I would take the, the, the converse point, which is, I think that patients really like this option because, you know, and, and I, I try not to oversell it when I do any form of denervation. I'd like you, I, I don't promise them the farm. I, I say this, this may work or it may not work, but you know, there's not a lot of downside. And I wanted to ask a question about that because Dr. Marchesol had a good question in the chat or a good comment about um, that there were described failures in young patients with high demands. And I sort of wonder if we're taking these sensory nerves and we're intentionally transecting them, you know, is some of our residual pain or or even uh, persistent pain, is that due to sensory nerve injuries? And if so, is, is that something people have seen? Or, you know, um, you mentioned Dr. McRae that you like to put a dermal graft or something. So what should we do to try to obviate that complication? Well, unfortunately, I haven't done enough to tell you. <laughs> but uh, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, in interesting question. I think I think data will be forthcoming as people are performing this procedure and, and following the results with, with uh, and you know, we're properly measuring the results as Dr. Del Signor has done for the past 12 so, so, so Dr. Machiso also mentioned that he would do this the innovation procedure for patients with depression or anxiety as well as opioid dependence and low demand hands. So do you think that would be one of your indications for the procedure as well? Yeah, I would, I would consider it an indication, yeah. I also would say, you know, in that young population group, there's so many variables. That, that could contribute to the fact that they're more active it could be a pain generator for them and why they didn't do as well as the retiree who, who you know, uh, doesn't ask as much of their thumb. So it, it can get pretty complicated in that regard, and especially when you have all these layers. Um, uh, I guess all, we'll all individually come up with our own sort of set of indications. And I applaud people who are pushing the envelope and, and I look forward to seeing what we learn. Um, we do need better studies though. I completely agree. Um, in the interest of time, we're a couple minutes past. I'd like to ask if there are any other uh, final questions for our excellent panelists. We'd like to thank uh, all the authors of the papers. We'd like to thank Dr. Rizzo for his expertise and experience. Uh, I think Dr. Chim has a few final words and uh, we really appreciate everyone's time this evening and we look forward to having you at a future uh, Hand in Focus webinar. And if you have thoughts about how to make this better or ideas, we would love to hear them. Uh, so go ahead, Harvey. Yeah, thank you so much, Kyle. And, you know, thank you so much to all the authors and the fellows as well as, as Dr. Rizzo. This was really fantastic. And thank you so much, everybody, for asking your questions. So these are the usual slides I have at the end of the, of the Journal Club. Please follow AHS on social media. Please consider applying for AHS membership. And uh, we have an AHS social media account. And please watch out for our next Journal Club. We do this every three months. And I, I think it's been really fantastic. I've learned so much from these Journal Clubs and we have a great panel. So please look out for our next journal club and uh, join us. And thank Harvey, you so much, everybody. Harvey, if you could just go back to the social media part, I, just for a second, I just want to reinforce that we we're really trying to uh, get folks engaged on the Hand Association social media account. We have uh, weekly questions that are now coming out uh, on Instagram. And if you if you're not following or if you're living under a rock in 2022 and don't have social media. Uh, please, please get it and, uh, and, and join the Hand Association. So thanks everyone for thinking about it. Okay. Thanks guys. I really appreciate the opportunity and honor and privilege to be a part of this. It was a great, uh, fun, educational and uh, awesome experience. Great. Okay. Thank you so much for your insight and thank you so much, everybody. Good night, Have everyone. a good evening, everyone. Good night, everybody.